Esther chapter 3, Esther chapter 3, uh, we're making our way through this, uh, this, this chapter. Now, it <clears throat> probably comes in no surprise to you, I'm a preacher after all, that I love words. I really love words. I love the right word in the right place. Some of you think, he tries to use big words. I really don't try to use big words. I've had actually people saying, I got to look up words you tell us sometimes. And I'm, I'm really not trying to be impressive. Sometimes I just think to myself, there is a really good word that fits right here, right? There's just the right word for the, for, for the right occasion. I'm, I'm fascinated by words. I'm fascinated by, by the way things develop and go in and out of style. Um, I am a child of the 80s. Anybody here a child of the 80s. I, was, I graduated high school smack dab in the middle of the 80s in 1985, and, uh, which was right smack dab in the middle of valley girl and surfer dude kind of talk, right? It was a totally gnarly time. You guys remember all that, right? So, so uh, and, and now that's out of fashion, right? So we don't talk that way anymore. Uh, some of you uh, studied Shakespeare maybe unwillingly in high school. How many of you? Right, I've got Steve Wilkie right here, our English professor, resident uh, poet laureate over here. And, uh, and, and uh, Shakespeare's one of the, it's, it's hard, isn't it, right? And the reason Shakespeare is difficult is that I'm guessing there's lots of words that you run into and go, we just don't even talk like this. Nobody says anon. Nobody says durst. We don't say thrice, right? There's all these words that simply we're like, look at them and go, I don't even know what I'm looking at anymore. They've, they've fallen out of fashion. They've fallen out of use. There are words to us that almost feel dead, they have no meaning to us. My concern is that one of those words is the word providence. Providence. We live in such a secularized culture that we have been baptized in and immersed in that very few of us use the word providence. What we use is its replacement. We think the replacement is luck, fate, we talk about fortune, you know, a stumbled upon, happenstance. That's how we talk. We've taken this idea of providence and said, it's really, well, how did you get that job? I was lucky I was in the right place at the right time. Nobody says, because in God's good providence, he brought me to this. Man, I long for, I just want to say this, I long for a people. I want to be a Christian that uses the word providence. I want to be us to be a people that looks and says, this is a word worth holding on to um, that will be something that, that should probably be circulating among us so that we don't look and say things are lucky or because of the fates or I had good fortune. We look and say, it's the pro I want us to be a people like Job that we just studied that can look at all the areas of our life and says, the Lord is gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's providence. That's providence. I hope we can become a people with that kind of muscular Christianity, right? A people that can go, you know what, when things are good and there's money in the bank and my job's going well and the kids are healthy and I'm healthy and life just seems to be flowing along, we go, man, this is the good providence of God. But when things are difficult and money's tight and the kids aren't healthy and things are not going like you planned, we can still be a people that looks and says, this is the providence of God. You know, people used to talk like this. I mean, like everybody, right? Again, Part of this is just we lived in a culture that recognized there's a God out there and you know, whether they believed what we believe now is really, if there, was, there was more of this sense of we just live in a culture that is imbued with religion and God and, 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 and so we would talk, people would talk on the street like this. We don't talk like this, uh, but we used to. William Cowper uh, was a theologian and he, he wrote a, 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 a hymn in 1773 called, called God moves in a mysterious way. You've probably heard that phrase, right? God moves in a mysterious way. I want you to listen to what he says. Listen to how he thinks about this. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. 
Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Now listen to this. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. I want to be a church, and I want to be a Christian that has the kind of faith that says there are times when, when I am experiencing a frowning providence, but by faith, I know that behind it is a smiling face. I know that. Understand, this is a persevering Christianity. This is a kind of, of faith that isn't shaken. We understand there are good providences. There are hard providences. Thomas Watson, we love to quote him. You've heard us quote him so many times. And he says, he says, until sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. Thomas Watson also wrote this. He says, God is to be trusted when his providences seem to run contrary to his promises. When frowning providences seem to run contrary to the promises of God, we can still trust God. Now, why do I tell you all this? Because chapter 3 of the book of Esther is a frowning providence. It is a hard, it's, it's something that if, you know, we have the benefit of reading from front to back and seeing the beauty of the story and the masterful way it's woven together. But if you're experiencing chapter three in real time, you would experience it as a frowning providence. What is God doing? How can I see him through all of this? And that's where I think the lesson for us is that we can look through this and understand where we see. So let's begin walking through chapter 3 together. And the first thing I want you to see is Mordecai's rebellion. Start reading in chapter 3 with me in verse 1. And after these th things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. Now stop right there and let's talk about this. Now where are we? Remember, um, Esther has now become queen. She became queen somewhere around, I think it says the, what, the seventh year of the reign of Ahasuerus. So she is now fully in place as queen uh, Mordecai found out after she was queen that, that someone was trying to uh, assassinate Queen Esther's husband, King Ahasuerus. So he goes and tells Queen Esther, Queen Esther tells the king, uh, make sure that he knows this is, this is Mordecai who foiled the plot. The, the, it's recorded in the presence of the king in his book of the chronicles of all the good deeds of the people that have been loyal to him. He sees it, he knows it. So when we turn the page to chapter two, after these things, there's a promotion that happens and you would assume, you would expect, if you'd never read this story before, the ha, here's where he gets his promotion. And he doesn't. Instead, this guy, Haman, gets a, pro a, 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 pro a promotion. It's not what we expect. And here is the first turn. Here is this reversal of fortune. And you're going to see this over and over again, right? Literature is filled with this. Movies are filled with this, right? Great stories are filled with reversals of fortune. And that's what's happening beginning here. But it kind of goes in the wrong way. It's, you think that he's supposed to be elevated and given a place of esteem, but he's not. He's passed over. Uh, he, he, he's left on his own. So what happens? Okay, so, so he promotes this Haman, the Agagite. And then look at verse 2. It says, And all the king's servants who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage. Now you follow what's happening. So here he's elevated to this place in the kingdom. Mordecai is, is, is one of the servants, and all the servants are told, you bow down, you pay homage. Mordecai doesn't do it. Why? I told you, one of the things you should be reading here is if you read the book of Esther, you should also read like the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. You should sort of get a feel of what exilic, right, life in exile is like. Daniel's going to tell you that, Nehemiah a little bit of that, Ezra, these are people coming back after the exile, but especially Daniel. And so if you read it, you might think, aha, 
What's happening here is that Haman, like Daniel's three friends who refused to bow down, that's what he's doing. What Haman is doing is saying, no, no way, I'm a Jew, and the only person I bow down to is God. Now, that might be, but I want to suggest to you that's probably not what's happening. This is probably, yes, it's courageous, but it's probably not his faithfulness to God that causes him to do that. And let me, let me give you a couple reasons why. Number one, bowing down is not necessarily an act of worship. In fact, you can go to Eastern countries today, and out of a show of respect, they will bow before you. It's not a worship thing. I'm not worshiping you. And the more respect they want to show, the closer to the ground they will get. So, so this is in Eastern cultures, many Eastern cultures, this is simply a show of respect, okay? That's the first thing I would say to you. In fact, if you go all the way to chapter 8, you're going to see that Esther bows before the king. So it's not the bowing. It's not, this is not this stand for righteousness necessarily. In fact, um, if you read Daniel, these are very, very different things that are happening here. What happens? Nebuchadnezzar says to everybody, hey, I'm going to erect this statue, this golden, this huge statue, and I'm going to set it in place. And when the harp and the, and the lyre and the trigon and all this stuff, when the music plays, everybody's going to bow down and worship that idol. It's very explicit. So to bow down in that moment is to worship. And his three friends say, not going to happen. We're not going to do that. That's not, that's not what's happening, I don't think, in Esther. I don't think what's happening is he's saying, man, if I bow down, I'm not being faithful to God. And I don't think he's sinning, by the way. I think he's got some courage here. But I don't think, I don't think it's faithfulness to God that is his primary motivation. I, I think the second thing is, is, is look at verse, chapter 3, verse 1 again. Okay, it tells us something about this Haman, and it tells us that he is an Agagite, right? Now, again, probably means nothing to most of us. He's an Agagite. Why does that matter? Okay, well, let me, I'm going to have to give you a little history here. So follow me, and we're going to make a bunch of little connections. Okay, so let's start off, and we have Haman, and he is a descendant of the Agagites who come from King Agag, and he is an Amalekite. King Agag, I see, should descends from the Amalekites. So, so, so you've got the Amalekites. So let's talk about this for a second. What we know about Haman right here is that he's an Amalekite. We can start there because the Amalekites have a long history with Israel. In fact, one of the oldest foes of Israel. If you go all the way back to chapter 17 of the book of Exodus, you find out that when Israel is wandering in the wilderness, that the Amalekites, unprovoked, come out and attack Israel. And here's what happens. When that happens, they're defeated, and, and God says, you know what? Because they did this, I'm going to wipe them out. God decrees the destruction of the Amalekites. They're over. They're done. They've had their day, and I'm done with the Amalekites. And he institutes. Now the wheels of God's justice start to turn, and I'm going to blot them out from the face of the earth. Listen to me, Christian. Let me just say it as an aside here. God is fiercely defensive of his people. God does not stand by passively when his people are hurting. And so even though it feels like they turn slow, right? The wheels of God's justice turn slow. They turn exceedingly fine. And God will work out his plan, okay? So that starts in process. God has decreed. You're never going to take that decree back. I have decreed the wiping out of the Amalekites. These are the long-standing enemies of Israel, okay? But it gets even more personal than that. We find out that Haman descends from Agag, okay? Now, so, so it's not just he's an Amalekite. He's a descendant of Agag. In fact, uh, why are we told this? Why does this matter? Okay, well, let me, before we do that, hold that in your mind and turn back to chapter 2 of Esther and look at verse 5. I told you this was going to come into play if you were here last week. We find out in verse 5 there's a Jew named Mordecai. What do we find out about Mordecai? Oh, interesting. Tells us his genealogy. He's the son of Jair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Now, why do we even need to know that? 
Why isn't it good enough to just know that he's a Jew? Because the, 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 the author of this is doing something for us, right? He's telling us there's a, there's a genealogy. There's something coming into play here that I, I want to try to make the connection for you. So, so in fact, if you, if you don't have to turn over there now, but if you, if you were to turn over to 1 Samuel, just write it in your margin. 1 Samuel 9 verses 1 through 2, we hear who, who, uh, who uh, Mordecai is. And here's his genealogy. There was a man of Benjamin, right? T- told he's a Benjaminite whose name was Kish, who, and he had a son whose name was Saul. Okay, now, if you know your Israel history at all, you know that Saul is the first king of Israel. He's the one that God anointed, brought him up. I'm going to set him over uh, the people. Uh, and you probably know he has kind of a sordid story behind him. There's all kinds of things that Saul did. But let me show you what Saul really did that tipped the scales against him. Okay, in, in fact, in, in first, cha- uh, first Samuel chapter 15, if you fast forward to that, what you find out, so, so again, now let me, I'm sorry, let me, let me just time out for a second. Here's what we know. We know Mordecai, we know Mordecai comes from this line. He, he is now, he's a descendant of Saul. We know that Haman is a, a descendant of Agag. Everybody follow me? I don't want to lose you here, okay? So we have these two lines happening. Now, why is this important? Because in first Samuel chapter 15, we hear this story. There's a story that Samuel the prophet comes and says, hey, here's what God has said. You're going to go and you're going to destroy King Agag and you're going to devote the Amalekites to destruction. Now, you're going to see this little phrase in the Old Testament, devote to destruction. Happens over and over again. Doesn't happen every time, but God will say of certain cities, God will say of certain peoples, God will say in certain battles, in this battle, I want you to devote it to destruction. It's a way of saying that when you go to that city, I want you to annihilate everything. I want you to keep nothing for yourself and offer everything, the devotion, offer this as a burnt offering to God. I want it all. Nothing left. Keep nothing for yourself. And what happens in 1 Samuel 15? Saul goes in. He defeats the Amalekites. But here's what he decides to do. I think I'll, I'll hold back and not do exactly what God asked me to do. So when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 9, it says this. Listen to this carefully. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted those to destruction. And Samuel's going to come and walk into the camp where Saul is and say, Saul, did you do what God asked you to do? And he said, I did. And Samuel has this famous line, then why do I hear the bleating of sheep in my ears? He says, well, I did. Here's what I did. And you know what the writer of Samuel is telling you? Here's what was in Saul's heart. You know what I'll do? What I'll do is give God all the stuff I don't want, and then I'll keep all the stuff I do want for me. Let me just say this out loud. God really frowns on that. And how many of us treat God like this? God, as long as I don't need it, you can have it. But if I really need it, and if it's really valuable, I'll keep it for myself. God, you can have my scraps. You can have all the stuff I don't want. You can't have the stuff I really want. David has this opportunity at one point. He, he goes and buys this threshing floor of Onan, we're told. This is actually where the temple will eventually be built. And he wants to buy it. And Onan says to him, no, 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 I'll give it to you. You take it and you offer it to God. And no, and they go back and forth. And finally, David says, no, Onan. Don't you understand? I cannot offer to God that which costs me nothing. I will not give back to God the worthlessness And this is the catalyst, this is the catalytic moment in Saul's life where God says, I'm done with you. 
Because all you do is give me the scraps. All you do, I've elevated you to king. I've blessed your life. I've done all this. And what do you do with me? You decide that what you're going to do is disobey me. And this is where he has the famous line. Samuel says, says, Saul, don't you understand that to obey is better than sacrifice? To obey is better. But he gives them all the leftovers And Saul is utterly rejected by God. Okay, so this is in the background. This is all the background to why we get this, you know, the descendant of Agag, the descendant of Benjamin. So so what's going on here? Well, look, let's keep going. Now let's get back to the book of Esther. And in, and in verses, uh, verses 3 and 4, look at, look at what we read here. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, uh, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. Aha. So now, now Haman knows, oh, I'm dealing with a Jew, and maybe whether he or not he made the connection, this is the son of Kish, the son of Saul, and I can trace this all the way back, and I can look back and say, these Jews wanted to annihilate us. That's in the back of Haman's mind. Now he knows in the back of Mordecai's mind is, man, this is a bridge too far. I will not bow down to somebody who shouldn't even be here if my ancestor Saul would have been obedient to God. This shouldn't even be happening. I won't give him that dignity. These are the long-standing rivalries. This is the Hatfields and McCoys, right? This is the Crips and the Bloods. This is, this is these sort of eternal enemies that cannot... Uh, make peace with one another, okay? So, 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 so we, we're, we're left here. Here, Mordecai says, I'm going to stand up. I'm not going to do that. And I think this is why. There's this old, long-standing rivalry in the background. So what's Haman's response? Look at verse 5. Verse 5, we read, And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So as they had made known to him the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So, so, so here's his response. Now, now look, this is odd in this sense that the Persians were understood to be tolerant of other religions. In fact, so tolerant that when the exiles, the Jewish exiles, are finally told, you can go home, many of them go, no, why? We got it good here. Like, my life is fine. I I don't need to leave and go home. I'll stay right here. I've got a good life. I've got a good job. We've got a good home. And they decide to stay because there's this toleration. But you stand up to the empire and things can go uh, south really quickly. This is what Haman does. Right? So, what does Haman do? He says, man, the killing of this one man is too small. Because of his offense, I'm going to take out the whole nation. We're going to annihilate the people of God. Now, let me just, let me just, just time out for a second again. Let me say something. When you read your Bible, I want you to notice, just make a note in your mind. You're going to see this all the time, especially in the Old Testament. You're going to see how one man uh, determines the fate of of the many. Happens over and over again. Adam's sin wrecks humanity, right? Moses stands as a mediator for all the people. One man stands in for the many. Achan's sin in the city of Ai in Joshua results in this one man, his his sin results in the judgment of the entire nation. The one man's sin or the one man's righteousness being imputed for the many. Then you get to Jesus and you find out the same thing, right? Just as Adam, the one man, did this, so Christ did the opposite and he is a salvation of many, right? So, so I, just, I just I point that out. I want you to see this. So, so here's Haman, and Haman goes, and Christian, here's what you need to understand, that there is a real enemy. Haman, if you will, stands in as the enemy of God's people who is not content to just take down one of us. You understand, Paul says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? So this is a flesh and blood story. 
But he says, we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of the air, demonic forces in high places who want to take down God's entire agenda and all his people. Christian husband and wife, God is not content simply to take you down, or the, the, the enemy is not content simply to take you down. He wants to take down your family. In fact, he wants to dismantle your family tree. If he can ruin, it's not just, oh, I'll take out the husband. No, no, I want the whole family. It's, it's not just, let's take out a pastor. Let's bury a church. But let's take out whole movements. And listen, we see it happening before us all the time. All the time. This is what the enemies of God want to do. This is what these spiritual powers have in mind to destroy. Okay, so this is Haman. He sort of stands in as that. And what does Haman do? Look in verse 7. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, not a car, a month, and in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, they cast poor. Okay, that is what they cast lots. Poor is going to become significant later in the story. Before Haman, day after day, and they cast it month after month till the 12th month, month, which is the month of Adar. These are all Jewish months. They mean nothing to us, but they will in a minute, okay? What I want you to see is what does he do, okay? What's he doing? He is not, this is not a godly thing he's doing. He probably consults astrologers and seers and fortune tellers and all of these. He says, hey, you assemble before me. And when he says they ca- he cast lots day after day, month after month, I don't think it means that every day he'd wake up and they'd cast a new set of lots. I think what it means is that he's, he's doing a process of elimination with dice. He's looking and saying, okay, is it this month? Rolls the dice, nope, this month. Nope, nope, until he gets all the way to the month of Adar. And Adar is near the last month of the Jewish calendar. Nisan is the first month of the Jewish calendar. And then once they've figured out the month, then they start rolling dice and they figure out the day and they land on Adar 13th. Okay, so that's where he is. This is my plan. I now know how this is all going to work out. Here's how the gods have told me they're going to favor me. This is the day when we will annihilate and exterminate the Jewish population within the Persian Empire. Okay, follow me. That's his response. And here's how we're going to do it. And I now know the day. Okay, so now watch what happens because you're going to see now the king's indifference. Look at verse 8. He says, then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples and all the provinces of your kingdom. True. Their laws are different from those of every other people. Mostly true. And they do not keep the king's laws. Not true. So that it's not to the king's profit to tolerate them. Okay? So so has he identified who he's talking about? As you say, there's these Jewish folk. Nothing like that. Okay, so far, very vague, half-truths, outright lies. And what does the king say? Or he says to the king in verse 9, If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charged the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasury. So the king took his signet ring... Uh, from his hand and gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people also to do with them as it seems good to you. Go for it. You, you can do what you've decided to do. Now, why does the king go along with this? Well, l- look, notice a few things. Number one, the king seems very unconcerned with details. Never says, what's this people you're talking about? Who are they? What have they done exactly? You say they disobey, no, nothing. No, no follow-up, no, no like, I want to interrogate this. I want to make sure that what we're doing is just nothing like this. He is happy with the vagaries of what, of what Haman brings to him. Now, now look, by the way, contrast this with chapter 1. Where in chapter 1, Queen Vashti sort of dishonors the king and says, I'm not coming to you and and parading in front of all your lecherous, drunken friends. That's not happening. And the king goes, imperial crisis, call on my cabinet. Let's figure out what's going on. Now they're talking about wiping out a people and he doesn't ask one question. Doesn't advise one person. It's a terrible king, right? This is horrible. He doesn't bother 
to get to the bottom of the truth. He just believes the report from a man that he looks at and says, oh, he's one of my trusted advisors. Wow. There's lessons in there for us Christians. Um, uh, we are people of truth. Just people of truth. And we, we push on things and we ask questions because we want the truth, not the voice of a pundit telling us what we should do. Okay? That's kind of what's happening here. So, so this is one reason. He doesn't, he doesn't ask any questions. He seems perfectly content. But I think you really get to why he's content, and that's because he's just motivated by greed. Look at this. Haman offers him 10,000 talents of silver. Okay, if you've got a little footnote there, it probably says something like, uh, a talent is 75 pounds. Okay, 750,000 pounds of silver. Um, lots of scholars believe that, uh, that this is the equivalent of anywhere between a half and two-thirds of the entire annual tax revenue of the empire. Where's Haman getting this money? Never ask that question. Right? Never ask them, you know, that's a lot of money. I mean, this is literally in today's money, this is like over $200 million. Like nobody has this kind of money, right? This is, the, this is, this is like the whole empire. This is like the United States. Half of our, half of our federal tax revenue would, would be owned by one person. Well, nobody's that rich. So, so, so he, he doesn't question that, but he is motivated by, then look, look, decisions are made really easy when money's on the line. When it's the difference between people and me being filthy rich, how often is that just people become irrelevant? This happens in politics all the time. This happens in our lives, right? So, so, so listen, I think there's some lessons in here, right? There's political lessons for us. That, that we, you know, listen, one of the things, here the king, he hands his signet ring to him and says, hey man, you just go and you, you do what you want with this. We, 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 are, we live in a democracy, so it doesn't quite work like that, but we have a vote and we, we give our vote to people. Just give it away. Are, are you careful with how you do this? Are you thoughtful? Do you just accept the headlines? Do you just accept what, what seems to be screaming at you in the media or do you look beyond it? and go, what's actually true here, right? That's my counsel to you. I can tell you how to vote. I'm just going to tell you, like, here's what you're doing. We, in some ways, mindlessly, blindly, hand our vote to people because they have the loudest voice and the most charming look or whatever it is and say, man, they seem really trustworthy. I'll do it. But this goes into our personal lives, not just our political lives. How many of us just follow the passions of our heart? Just do what feels good. How many of us make decisions because it's financially expedient for us? How many of us hand over our signet ring, if you will, hand over our integrity to save a few dollars on a tax return? See, see what I mean? Like th this, is, this, is, this is real stuff that we're being confronted with here. Like here's the king saying, man, I, I, I really don't, care. In fact, let's go on because you're going to see how much he doesn't care and you'll see the decree's effect here. So now look at verse 12. He says, then the king's scribes were summoned on the 13th day of the first month. That's Nisan. And then edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written to the king's satraps, to the governors over all the provinces, to the officials of the peoples, to every province in its own script, every people in its own language. Okay, this goes out across the empire. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel, okay? And so here, here's this, the pogrom, right? This, 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 we're going to annihilate the Jews has gone out. The date has been fixed. It's Adar the 13th. And, and it goes out. And what do the king and what do Haman do? They have a cocktail. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city was thrown into confusion. I think, man, in his smug satisfaction, everything's waiting. The edict goes out. Now think about this. 
The edict then goes out on the, on, it, it, it goes out on the 13th day of Nisan. It's going to be all the way to the 15th of, of Adar, right? Something almost a year away. And, and everybody knows this is going to happen. So in addition to the Jews being exterminated, now what they get is the anxiety of every single day their doom draws closer. It sends the entire capital city into confusion, and the king and Haman decide they're just going to have a drink. We don't really care. Haman sits there with smug satisfaction saying, man, I have sealed this with the king's ring. All I got to do is sit back passively and watch. I've asked the gods. I've rolled the dice. Everything is going according to my plan with the king's edict. And he failed to reckon with the fact that there's a higher king. There's a higher king, right? Remember what we said? Week number one, really this is an extended... um, uh, a commentary on Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is like a river in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wants. Remember what the Proverbs say, Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Every single dice that is cast in Vegas. There is no, nothing random happening here. God knew exactly what he was doing when he picked the days, fixed the time. God did that. But why? Why does all this happen? Um, uh, all this is God's timing. And all this, if I'm living this out in real time, feels like a frowning providence, doesn't it? God, what are you doing? You let your people be wiped out? You're going to let this go forward? I, 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 I'm not even sure. Like, but, but here's what I want you to see, that behind that frowning providence, God's got a smiling face. He knows what he's doing. He is working all things according to the counsel of his will. These are his people. They are his people. And he will come to their aid. He knows what he's doing. They are not subject to the rule of dice. They are not subject to fate. They are not subject to luck. They are not subject to bad fortune. They are firmly fixed within the invisible providential hand of God. What feels like a frowning providence will turn out to show a smiling face. Listen to me. This is how God talks. God says, the heart of man, Proverbs 16, 9, plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. I'm going to do this, but God, you know all the dodges and turns. You know how that's going to happen or whether it's going to happen. That's providence. In, here's what Jesus says. In this world, you will have trouble. Christian, in this world, there will be frowning providences. And Jesus says, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Take heart. Behind that, that's the smiling providence. Do you understand? I've overcome. I, I conquer it all. I know exactly what I'm doing. I am, I am orchestrating the puzzle pieces exactly how I want them to go off. I've overcome. That's the smiling providence. And hear me. This is, we know this because we can read it after the fact, but I want you to see tucked into this decree, this horrible, monstrous decree is a smiling providence. Is a, is a smiling face of God, is, a, if you will, a secret message. Let me, let, me, let me put it this way. It all happens in the month of Nisan. And the decree goes out on the 13th of Nisan. And you're like, means nothing to me. Because we don't use this calendar, right? We don't, we don't, we don't have, we, we don't even know where that looks on our calendar. The Jews use a completely different calendar that sort of moves around, moon phases, all these different stuff that, that causes it to be adjusted. And so it doesn't follow what feels like our systematic calendar. But let me see if I can help you. Like if I'm a Jew and I understand where things, I understand dates and I understand these, these Jewish months, this is going to feel radically different to me. For example, if I were to say to you, the government on July 2nd issued a decree that next year religion will be outlawed. Would you find that a little like ironic that it happened on July 2nd, right before our Independence Day? 
What if I said on December 23rd, about a year from now, 300 days from now, we're going to outlaw gift giving? Like, Why did they do it there? Why did they put that date right there to do it where it feels so ironically cruel? Now, here's what I'm saying. Nissan 13 is right smack dab in the middle of Passover. On Nisan 10, if you read the book of Exodus and Leviticus, you discover that on Nisan 10, you would, you would bring the little lamb for slaughter into your home. It would be with you for five days, and that lamb would be slaughtered on the 15th. What's Passover, by the way? Passover is a celebration of the freedom of the people of God from the oppression of Egypt, right? We take in the New Testament, it transposes over into Christ, and we say Egypt stands in as this place of of oppression and sin, and Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, sacrifices himself on our behalf, and now death passes over us, we are freed, we are, uh, the, the captivity that we're in has been broken, and now we're out of prison, right? Spiritually. So here's the people of God going right here, are you kidding me? In the middle of this, in the middle of this, this decree is issued and it feels cruel and it feels like a frowning providence. Unless you know what we know, to know that now the wheels of God's justice will begin to turn. Now the reversal of fortune will start to take place. What feels like a frowning providence hides a smiling face. God has instituted through this decree the freedom of his people. They don't know it yet, but that's exactly where this has gone. Or as William Cowper ends his hymn, listen to how he ends his hymn. He says this, his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. Take heart, Christian. Take heart. You may be in the midst of a frowning providence. And if you're not, those days are probably coming. And what I want you to hear is that behind that, There is a smiling face of God who always comes and will come to the aid of his people. And you will be vindicated and vengeance will be his as he works out his plan for his glory and for your good. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the book of Esther. God, I love this story. I love seeing the invisible hand of your providence working all things according to the counsel of your will. Help us to see it, God. Help us to apply it. Lord, I pray for my friends in this room. No doubt there are many who would say, I am under a cloud of frowning providence. But God, I pray. I pray that in in the near future, they would see behind that is a smiling face is a smiling, pleased face of God, working things for his glory, your glory, God, and for our good. God, I pray, I pray perhaps there are people here this morning, I'm sure there are, that would look and say, because of the frowning providence of God, I have found my way into this place. I didn't know where else to turn. And so, God, they find themselves here under that cloud And Lord, I can't help but think there is a smile behind that saying, you are exactly where I want you so you would hear the gospel and you would know the good news that will splash a smile across your face that I can change you and I can forgive you and I can cancel the debt that is nailed against you. That God, today would be a day of freedom for them to know that they don't have to live under the weight of their sin any longer. But through repentance and faith, they can turn and know what it means to have God as a father and Christ as a brother. Would you do that today, I pray. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name.